We'd like to welcome everyone to the FP Network, where we are loving God, loving people, and treasuring Jesus together. The book of 2 Samuel, chapter 1, the Christian Standard Bible. After the death of Saul, David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed at Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man with torn clothes and dust on his head came from Saul's camp. When he came to David, he fell to the ground and paid homage. David asked him, Where have you come from? He replied to him, I've escaped from the Israelite camp. What was the outcome? Tell me, David asked him. The troops fled from the battle, he answered. Many of the troops have fallen and are dead. Also Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. David asked the young man who had brought him the report, How do you know Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, he replied, and there was Saul leaning on his spear. At that very moment the chariots and the cavalry were closing in on him. When he turned around and saw me, he called out to me, so I answered, I'm at your service, he asked me. Who are you? I told him, I'm an Amalekite. Then he begged me, Stand over me and kill me, for I am mortally wounded, but my life still lingers. So I stood over him and killed him, because I knew that after he had fallen, he couldn't survive. I took the crown that was on his head and the armband that was on his arm, and I brought them here to my Lord. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and all the men with him did the same. They mourned, wept, and fasted until the evening for those who died by the sword, for Saul, his son Jonathan, the Lord's people, and the house of Israel. David inquired of the young man who had brought him the report, where are you from? I'm the son of a resident alien, he said. I'm an Amalekite. David questioned him. How is it that you were not afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David summoned one of his servants and said, Come here and kill him. The servant struck him and he died. For David had said to the Amalekite, your blood is on your own head because your own mouth testified against you by saying, I killed the Lord's anointed. David sang the following lament for Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered that the Judahites be taught the song of the bow. It is written in the book of Jeshur. The splendor of Israel lies slain on your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Do not tell it in Gath. Don't announce it in the marketplaces of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice, and the daughters of the uncircumcised will celebrate. Mountains of Gilboa, let no dew or rain be on you, or fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, no longer anointed with oil. Jonathan's bow never retreated, Saul's sword never returned unstained from the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty. Saul and Jonathan loved and delightful. They were not parted in life or in death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxurious things, who decked your garments with gold ornaments. How the mighty have fallen in the thick of battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were such a friend to me. Your love for me was more wondrous than the love of a woman. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war have perished. Chapter 2 some time later, David inquired of the Lord, Should I go to one of the towns of Judah? The Lord answered him, Go. Then David asked, Where should I go? To Hebron, the Lord replied. 
So David went there with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. In addition, David brought the men who were with him, each one with his family, and they settled in the towns near Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. They told David, It was the men of Jabesh-Gilead who buried Saul. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh-Gilead and said to them, The Lord bless you because you have shown this kindness to Saul your Lord when you buried him. Now may the Lord show kindness and faithfulness to you, and I will also show the same goodness to you because you have done this deed. Therefore be strong and valiant, for though Saul your Lord is dead, the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Abner, son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Saul's son Ishbosheth and moved him to Mahanaim. He made him king over Gilead, Asher, Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, over all Israel. Saul's son Ishbosheth was forty years old when he became king over Israel. He reigned for two years. The house of Judah, however, followed David. The length of time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Abner, son of Ner, and soldiers of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, marched out from Mahanaim to Gibeon to Joab, son of Zeruiah. And David's soldiers marched out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. The two groups took up positions on opposite sides of the pool. Then Abner said to Joab, Let's have the young men get up and compete in front of us. Let them get up, Joab replied. So they got up and were counted off, twelve for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and twelve from David's soldiers. Then each man grabbed his opponent by the head and thrust his sword into his opponent's side so that they all died together. So this place, which is in Gibeon, is named Field of Blades. The battle that day was extremely fierce, and Abner and the men of Israel were defeated by David's soldiers. The three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Asahel was a fast runner, like one of the wild gazelles. He chased Abner and did not turn to the right or the left in his pursuit of him. Abner glanced back and said, Is that you, Asahel? Yes, it is, Asahel replied. Abner said to him, Turn to your right or left, seize one of the young soldiers, and take whatever you can get from him. But Asahel would not stop chasing him. Once again, Abner warned Asahel, Stop chasing me! Why should I strike you to the ground? How could I ever look your brother Joab in the face? But Asahel refused to turn away. So Abner hit him in the stomach with the butt of his spear. The spear went through his body, and he fell and died right there. As they all came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died, they stopped. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner. By sunset, they had gone as far as the hill of Ammah, which is opposite Gia, on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. The Benjaminites rallied to Abner. They formed a unit and took their stand on top of a hill. Then Abner called out to Joab, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize this will only end in bitterness? How long before you tell the troops to stop pursuing their brothers? As God lives, Joab replied, if you had not spoken up, the troops wouldn't have stopped pursuing their brothers until morning. Then Joab blew the ram's horn, and all the troops stopped. They no longer pursued Israel or continued to fight. So Abner and his men marched through the Arabah all that night. They crossed the Jordan, marched all morning, and arrived at Mahanaim. When Joab had turned back from pursuing Abner, he gathered all the troops. In addition to Asahel, 19 of David's soldiers were missing, but they had killed 360 of the Benjaminites and Abner's men. Afterward, they carried Asahel to his father's tomb in Bethlehem and buried him.
Then Joab and his men marched all night and reached Hebron at dawn. Chapter 3 During the long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, David was growing stronger and the house of Saul was becoming weaker. Sons were born to David in Hebron. His first was Amnon by Ahinoam the Jezreelite. His second was Chiliab by Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. The third was Absalom, son of Maacah, the daughter of King Talmai of Geshur. The fourth was Adonijah, son of Haggith. The fifth was Shephatiah, son of Abital. The sixth was Ithream by David's wife Eglah. These were born to David in Hebron. During the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner kept acquiring more power in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, daughter of Aiah, and Ishbosheth questioned Abner, Why did you sleep with my father's concubine? Abner was very angry about Ishbosheth's accusation. Am I a dog's head who belongs to Judah? he asked. All this time I've been loyal to the family of your father Saul, to his brothers, and to his friends, and haven't betrayed you to David. But now you accuse me of wrongdoing with this woman. May God punish Abner and do so severely if I don't do for David what the Lord swore to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and establish the throne of David over Israel and Judah from Dan to Beersheba. Ishbosheth did not dare respond to Abner because he was afraid of him. Abner sent messengers as his representatives to say to David, Whose land is it? Make your covenant with me, and you can be certain I am on your side to turn all Israel over to you. David replied, Good, I will make a covenant with you. However, there's one thing I require of you. You will not see my face unless you first bring Saul's daughter, Michael, when you come to see me. Then David sent messengers to say to Ishbosheth, son of Saul, Give me back my wife, Michael. I was engaged to her for the price of a hundred Philistine foreskins. So Ishbosheth sent someone to take her away from her husband, Paltiel, son of Laish. Her husband followed her, weeping all the way to Bahurim. Abner said to him, Go back. So he went back. Abner conferred with the elders of Israel. In the past, you wanted David to be king over you. Now take action because the Lord has spoken concerning David. Through my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the power of the Philistines and the power of all Israel's enemies. Abner also informed the Benjaminites and went to Hebron to inform David about all that was agreed on by Israel and the whole house of Benjamin. When Abner and 20 men came to David at Hebron, David held a banquet for him and his men. Abner said to David, let me now go, and I will gather all Israel to my lord, the king. They will make a covenant with you, and you will reign over all you desire. So David dismissed Abner, and he went in peace. Just then, David's soldiers and Joab returned from a raid and brought a large amount of plundered goods with them. Abner was not with David in Hebron because David had dismissed him, and he had gone in peace. When Joab and his whole army arrived, Joab was informed. Abner, son of Ner, came to see the king. The king dismissed him, and he went in peace. Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Look here, Abner came to you. Why did you dismiss him? Now he's getting away. You know that Abner, son of Ner, came to deceive you and to find out about your military activities and everything you're doing. Then Joab left David and sent messengers after Abner. They brought him back from the well of Sirah, but David was unaware of it. When Abner returned to Hebron, Joab pulled him aside to the middle of the city gate as if to speak to him privately, and there Joab stabbed him in the stomach. 
So Abner died in revenge for the death of Asahel, Joab's brother. David heard about it later and said, I and my kingdom are forever innocent before the Lord concerning the blood of Abner, son of Ner. May it hang over Joab's head and his father's whole family, and may the house of Joab never be without someone who has a discharge or a skin disease, or a man who can only work a spindle, or someone who falls by the sword or starves. Joab and his brother Abishai killed Abner because he had put their brother Asahel to death in the battle at Gibeon. David then ordered Joab and all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourn over Abner. And King David walked behind the coffin. When they buried Abner in Hebron, the king wept aloud at Abner's tomb. All the people wept, and the king sang a lament for Abner. Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet not placed in bronze shackles. You fell like one who falls victim to criminals. And all the people wept over him even more. Then they came to urge David to eat food while it was still day. But David took an oath. May God punish me and do so severely if I taste bread or anything else before sunset. All the people took note of this, and it pleased them. In fact, everything the king did pleased them. On that day, all the troops and all Israel were convinced that the king had no part in the killing of Abner, son of Ner. Then the king said to his soldiers, You must know that a great leader has fallen in Israel today. As for me, even though I am the anointed king, I have little power today. These men, the sons of Zeruiah, are too fierce for me. May the Lord repay the evildoer according to his evil. Chapter 4 When Saul's son Ishbosheth heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he gave up, and all Israel was dismayed. Saul's son had two men who were leaders of raiding parties, one named Baana and the other Rechab, sons of Remon, the Beerothite of the Benjaminites. Beeroth is also considered part of Benjamin, and the Beerothites fled to Gittim and still reside there as aliens today. Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son whose feet were crippled. He was five years old when the report about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nanny picked him up and fled, but as she was hurrying to flee, he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Rechab and Baana, the sons of Remon, the Beerothite, set out and arrived at Ishbosheth's house during the heat of the day while the king was taking his midday nap. They entered the interior of the house as if to get wheat and stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and his brother Baana escaped. They had entered the house while Ishbosheth was lying on his bed in his bedroom and stabbed and killed him. They removed his head, took it, and traveled by way of the Arabah all night. They brought Ishbosheth's head to David at Hebron and said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, your enemy who intended to take your life. Today the Lord has granted vengeance to my lord, the king, against Saul and his offspring. But David answered Rechab and his brother Baana, sons of Remon the Beerothite, as the Lord lives, the one who has redeemed my life from every distress, when the person told me, Look, Saul is dead. He thought he was a bearer of good news, but I seized him and put him to death at Ziklag. That was my reward to him for his good news. How much more when wicked men kill a righteous man in his own house on his own bed. So now, should I not require his blood from you and purge you from the earth? So David gave orders to the young men, and they killed Rechab and Baana. They cut off their hands and feet and hung their bodies by the pool in Hebron. But they took Ishbosheth's head and buried it in Abner's tomb in Hebron. Chapter 5 
Chapter 5 All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Here we are, your own flesh and blood. Even while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led us out to battle and brought us back. The Lord also said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. King David made a covenant with them at Hebron in the Lord's presence, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was thirty years old when he began his reign. He reigned forty years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty-three years over all Israel and Judah. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites who inhabited the land. The Jebusites had said to David, You will never get in here. Even the blind and lame can repel you, thinking, David can't get in here. Yet David did capture the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. He said that day, Whoever attacks the Jebusites must go through the water shaft to reach the lame and the blind who are despised by David. For this reason it is said, the blind and the lame will never enter the house. David took up residence in the stronghold, which he named the city of David. He built it up all the way around from the supporting terraces inward. David became more and more powerful, and the Lord God of armies was with him. King Hiram of Tyre sent envoys to David. He also sent cedar logs, carpenters, and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. Then David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. After he arrived from Hebron, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. These are the names of those born to him in Jerusalem, Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishema, Eliada, and Eliphalet. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they all went in search of David. But he heard about it and went down to the stronghold. So the Philistines came and spread out in Rephaim Valley. Then David inquired of the Lord, Should I attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord replied to David, Attack, for I will certainly hand the Philistines over to you. So David went to baal Perazim and defeated them there and said, Like a bursting flood, the Lord has burst out against my enemies before me. Therefore he named that place, The Lord Bursts Out. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. The Philistines came up again and spread out in Rephaim Valley. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, Do not attack directly, but circle around behind them and come at them opposite the balsam trees. When you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, act decisively, for then the Lord will have gone out ahead of you to strike down the army of the Philistines. So David did exactly as the Lord commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Geba to Gezer. Chapter 6 David again assembled all the fit young men in Israel, 30,000. He and all his troops set out to bring the ark of God from Baal Judah. The ark bears the name the name of the Lord of armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. They set the ark of God on a new cart and transported it from Abinadab's house, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the cart and brought it with the ark of God from Abinadab's house on the hill. Ahio walked in front of the ark. David and the whole house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all kinds of fir wood instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. 
When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah reached out to the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen had stumbled. Then the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and God struck him dead on the spot for his irreverence, and he died there next to the ark of God. David was angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, so he named that place Outburst Against Uzzah, as it is today. David feared the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? So he was not willing to bring the ark of the Lord to the city of David. Instead, he diverted it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of the Lord remained in his house three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his whole family. It was reported to King David, The Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's family and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and had the ark of God brought up from Obed-Edom's house to the city of David with rejoicing. When those carrying the ark of the Lord advanced six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened calf. David was dancing with all his might before the Lord, wearing a linen ephod. He and the whole house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of the ram's horn. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Saul's daughter, Michael, looked down from the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent David had pitched for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings in the Lord's presence. When David had finished offering the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord's armies. Then he distributed a loaf of bread, a date cake, and a raisin cake to each one in the entire Israelite community, both men and women. Then all the people went home. When David returned home to bless his household, Saul's daughter, Michael, came out to meet him. How the king of Israel honored himself today, she said. He exposed himself today in the sight of the slave girls of his subjects like a vulgar person would expose himself. David replied to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me over your father and his whole family to appoint me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will dance before the Lord, and I will dishonor myself and humble myself even more. However, by the slave girls you spoke about, I will be honored. And Saul's daughter Michael had no child to the day of her death. Chapter 7 When the king had settled into his palace, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies, the king said to the prophet Nathan, Look, I am living in a cedar house while the ark of God sits inside tent curtains. So Nathan told the king, Go and do all that is on your mind, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go to my servant David and say, This is what the Lord says. Are you to build me a house to dwell in? From the time I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until today, I have not dwelt in a house. Instead, I have been moving around with a tent as my dwelling. In all my journeys with all the Israelites, have I ever spoken a word to one of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, asking, Why haven't you built me a house of cedar? So now this is what you are to say to my servant David. This is what the Lord of armies says. I took you from the pasture from tending the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. I will make a great name for you like that of the greatest on the earth. I will designate a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may live there and not be disturbed again. Evildoers will not continue to oppress them as they have done ever since the day I ordered judges to be over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. 
When your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with a rod of men and blows from mortals. But my faithful love will never leave him as it did when I removed it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported all these words and his entire vision to David. Then King David went in, sat in the Lord's presence, and said, Who am I, Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? What you have done so far was a little thing to you, Lord God, for you have also spoken about your servant's house in the distant future. And this is a revelation for mankind, Lord God. What more can David say to you? You know your servant, Lord God. Because of your word and according to your will, you have revealed all these great things to your servant. This is why you are great, Lord God. There is no one like you, and there is no God besides you, as all we have heard confirms. And who is like your people Israel? God came to one nation on earth in order to redeem a people for himself, to make a name for himself, and to perform for them great and awesome acts, driving out nations and their gods before your people you redeemed for yourself from Egypt. You established your people Israel to be your own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. Now, Lord God, fulfill the promise forever that you have made to your servant and his house. Do as you have promised, so that your name will be exalted forever, when it is said, The Lord of armies is God over Israel. The house of your servant David will be established before you, since you, Lord of armies, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant when you said, I will build a house for you. Therefore, your servant has found the courage to pray this prayer to you. Lord God, you are God. Your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, please bless your servant's house, so that it will continue before you forever. For you, Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing, your servant's house will be blessed forever. Chapter 8 After this, David defeated the Philistines, subdued them, and took Methag Amma from Philistine control. He also defeated the Moabites, and after making them lie down on the ground, he measured them off with a cord. He measured every two cord lengths of those to be put to death, and one full length of those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's subjects and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah, when he went to restore his control at the Euphrates River. David captured 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers from him, and he hamstrung all the horses and kept a hundred chariots. When the Arameans of Damascus came to assist King Hadadezer of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 Aramean men. Then he placed garrisons in Aram of Damascus, and the Arameans became David's subjects and brought tribute. The Lord made David victorious wherever he went. David took the gold shields of Hadadezer's officers and brought them to Jerusalem. King David also took huge quantities of bronze from Beta and from Barathai, Hadadezer's cities. When King Toy of Hamath heard that David had defeated the entire army of Hadadezer, he sent his son Joram to King David to greet him and to congratulate him because David had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him. For Toy and Hadadezer had fought many wars. Joram had items of silver, gold, and bronze with him. 
King David also dedicated these to the Lord along with the silver and gold he had dedicated from all the nations he had subdued, from Edom, Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Amalekites, and the spoil of Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. David made a reputation for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in Salt Valley. He placed garrisons throughout Edom, and all the Edomites were subject to David. The Lord made David victorious wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel, administering justice and righteousness for all his people. Joab, son of Zeruiah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was court historian. Zadok, son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, son of Abiathar, were priests. Sariah was court secretary. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and the Pelathites, and David's sons were chief officials. Chapter 9. David asked, Is there anyone remaining from the family of Saul I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? There was a servant of Saul's family named Ziba. They summoned him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? I am your servant, he replied. So the king asked, Is there anyone left of Saul's family that I can show the kindness of God to? Ziba said to the king, there is still Jonathan's son who was injured in both feet. The king asked him, Where is he? Ziba answered the king, You'll find him in Lodibar, at the house of Maker, son of Amiel. So King David had him brought from the house of Maker, son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell face down, and paid homage. David said, Mephibosheth, I am your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, since I intend to show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all your grandfather Saul's fields, and you will always eat meals at my table. Mephibosheth paid homage and said, What is your servant that you take an interest in a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's attendant Ziba and said to him, I have given to your master's grandson all that belonged to Saul and his family. You, your sons, and your servants are to work the ground for him, and you are to bring in the crops so your master's grandson will have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, is always to eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do all my lord the king commands. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table just like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. All those living in Ziba's house were Mephibosheth's servants. However, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. His feet had been injured. Chapter 10. Some time later, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son Hanan became king in his place. Then David said, I'll show kindness to Hanan, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent his emissaries to console Hanan concerning his father. However, when they arrived in the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite leaders said to Hanan their lord, just because David has sent men with condolences for you, do you really believe he's showing respect for your father? Instead, hasn't David sent his emissaries in order to scout out the city, spy on it, and demolish it? So Hanan took David's emissaries, shaved off half their beards, cut their clothes in half at the hips, and sent them away. When this was reported to David, he sent someone to meet them, since they were deeply humiliated. The king said, Stay in Jericho until your beards grow back, then return. 
When the Ammonites realized they had become repulsive to David, they hired 20,000 foot soldiers from the Arameans of Beth Rehob and Zobah, 1,000 men from the king of Maacah, and 12,000 men from Tob. David heard about it and sent Joab and all the elite troops. The Ammonites marched out and lined up in battle formation at the entrance to the city gate, while the Arameans of Zobah and Rehob and the men of Tob and Maacah were in the field by themselves. When Joab saw that there was a battle line in front of him and another behind him, he chose some of Israel's finest young men and lined up in formation to engage the Arameans. He placed the rest of the forces under the command of his brother Abishai. They lined up in formation to engage the Ammonites. If the Arameans are too strong for me, Joab said, then you will be my help. However, if the Ammonites are too strong for you, I'll come to help you. Be strong. Let's prove ourselves strong for our people and for the cities of our God. May the Lord's will be done. Joab and his troops advanced to fight against the Arameans, and they fled before him. When the Ammonites saw that the Arameans had fled, they too fled before Abishai and entered the city. So Joab withdrew from the attack against the Ammonites and went to Jerusalem. When the Arameans saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they regrouped. Hadadezer sent messengers to bring the Arameans who were beyond the Euphrates River, and they came to Helam with Shobach, commander of Hadadezer's army, leading them. When this was reported to David, he gathered all Israel, crossed the Jordan, and went to Helam. Then the Arameans lined up to engage David in battle and fought against him. But the Arameans fled before Israel, and David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 foot soldiers. He also struck down Shobach, commander of their army, who died there. When all the kings who were Hadadezer's subjects saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel and became their subjects. After this, the Arameans were afraid to ever help the Ammonites again. Chapter 11 In the spring, when kings march out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening... David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he said, Isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, and wife of Uriah the Hethite? David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had just been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Afterward, she returned home. The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. David sent orders to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hethite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the troops were doing and how the war was going. Then he said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the palace with all his master's servants. He did not go down to his house. When it was reported to David, Uriah didn't go home. David questioned Uriah, Haven't you just come from a journey? Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered David, The ark, Israel, and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my house to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? As surely as you live and by your life, I will not do this. Stay here today also, David said to Uriah, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him, and David got him drunk. He went out in the evening to lie down on his cot with his master's servants, but he did not go home. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In the letter he wrote, 
Put Uriah at the front of the fiercest fighting, then withdraw from him so that he is struck down and dies. When Joab was besieging the city, he put Uriah in the place where he knew the best enemy soldiers were. Then the men of the city came out and attacked Joab, and some of the men from David's soldiers fell in battle. Uriah the Hethite also died. Joab sent someone to report to David all the details of the battle. He commanded the messenger, When you finish telling the king all the details of the battle, if the king's anger gets stirred up and he asks you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you realize they would shoot from the top of the wall? At Thebes, who struck Abimelech, son of Jerubesheth, didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the top of the wall so that he died? Why did you get so close to the wall? Then say, your servant Uriah the Hethite is dead also. Then the messenger left. When he arrived, he reported to David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger reported to David, The men gained the advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we counterattacked right up to the entrance of the city gate. However, the archers shot down on your servants from the top of the wall, and some of the king's servants died. Your servant Uriah the Hethite is also dead. David told the messenger, Say this to Joab, don't let this matter upset you because the sword devours all alike. Intensify your fight against the city and demolish it. Encourage him. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah had died, she mourned for him. When the time of mourning ended, David had her brought to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. However, the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. Chapter 12. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised her, and she grew up with him and with his children. From his meager food she would eat, from his cup she would drink, and in his arms she would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. Because he has done this thing and shown no pity, he must pay four lambs for that lamb. Nathan replied to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. Why then have you despised the Lord's command by doing what I consider evil? You struck down Uriah the Hethite with the sword and took his wife as your own wife. You murdered him with the Ammonite sword. Now, therefore, the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hethite to be your own wife. This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on you from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes, and he will sleep with them in broad daylight. You acted in secret, but I will do this before all Israel and in broad daylight. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Then Nathan replied to David, and the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. However, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. Then Nathan went home. The Lord struck the baby that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became deathly ill. David pleaded with God for the boy. He fasted, went home, and spent the night lying on the ground. 
The elders of his house stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat anything with them. On the seventh day, the baby died. But David's servants were afraid to tell him the baby was dead. They said, Look, while the baby was alive, we spoke to him and he wouldn't listen to us. So how can we tell him the baby is dead? He may do something desperate. When David saw that his servants were whispering to each other, he guessed that the baby was dead. So he asked his servants, Is the baby dead? He is dead, they replied. Then David got up from the ground. He washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went to the Lord's house and worshiped. Then he went home and requested something to eat. So they served him food and he ate. His servants asked him, Why have you done this? While the baby was alive, you fasted and wept, but when he died, you got up and ate food. He answered, While the baby was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I'll go to him, but he will never return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. He went to her and slept with her. She gave birth to a son and named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, and he sent a message through the prophet Nathan, who named him Jedidiah, because of the Lord. Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and captured the royal fortress. Then Joab sent messengers to David to say, I have fought against Rabbah and have also captured his water supply. Now, therefore, assemble the rest of the troops, lay siege to the city, and capture it. Otherwise, I will be the one to capture the city, and it will be named after me. So David assembled all the troops and went to Rabbah. He fought against it and captured it. He took the crown from the head of their king, and it was placed on David's head. The crown weighed 75 pounds of gold, and it had a precious stone in it. In addition, David took away a large quantity of plunder from the city. He removed the people who were in the city and put them to work with saws, iron picks, and iron axes, and to labor at brick making. He did the same to all the Ammonite cities. Then he and all his troops returned to Jerusalem. Chapter 13 Some time passed. David's son, Absalom, had a beautiful sister named Tamar, and David's son Amnon was infatuated with her. Amnon was frustrated to the point of making himself sick over his sister Tamar because she was a virgin, but it seemed impossible to do anything to her. Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, a son of David's brother Shimea. Jonadab was a very shrewd man, and he asked Amnon, why are you, the king's son, so miserable every morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon replied, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend you're sick. When your father comes to see you, say to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare a meal in my presence so I can watch and eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be sick. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my presence so I can eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, Please go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare a meal for him. Then Tamar went to his house while Amnon was lying down. She took dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his presence, and baked them. She brought the pan and set it down in front of him, but he refused to eat. Amnon said, Everyone leave me, and everyone left him. Bring the meal to the bedroom, Amnon told Tamar, so I can eat from your hand. Tamar took the cakes she had made and went to her brother Amnon's bedroom. When she brought them to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, 
Come sleep with me, my sister. Don't, my brother, she cried, don't disgrace me, for such a thing should never be done in Israel. Don't commit this outrage. Where could I ever go with my humiliation? And you, you would be like one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Please speak to the king, for he won't keep me from you. But he refused to listen to her, and because he was stronger than she was, he disgraced her by raping her. So Amnon hated Tamar with such intensity that the hatred he hated her with was greater than the love he had loved her with. Get out of here, he said. No, she cried. Sending me away is much worse than the great wrong you've already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. Instead, he called to the servant who waited on him. Get this away from me. Throw her out and bolt the door behind her. Amnon's servant threw her out and bolted the door behind her. Now Tamar was wearing a long-sleeved robe because this is what the king's virgin daughters wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long-sleeved robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away, crying out. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has your brother Amnon been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in the house of her brother Absalom. When King David heard about all these things, he was furious. Absalom didn't say anything to Amnon, either good or bad, because he hated Amnon since he disgraced his sister Tamar. Two years later, Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal Hazel or near Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. Then he went to the king and said, Your servant has just hired sheep shearers. Will the king and his servants please come with your servant? The king replied to Absalom, No, my son, we should not all go, or we would be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he wasn't willing to go, though he did bless him. If not, Absalom said, Please let my brother Amnon go with us. The king asked him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, so he sent Amnon and all the king's sons. Now Absalom commanded his young men, Watch Amnon until he is in a good mood from the wine. When I order you to strike Amnon, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Am I not the one who has commanded you? Be strong and valiant. So Absalom's young men did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. Then all the rest of the king's sons got up and each fled on his mule. While they were on the way, a report reached David. Absalom struck down all the king's sons. Not even one of them survived. In response, the king stood up, tore his clothes, and lay down on the ground, and all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab, son of David's brother, Shimea, spoke up. My Lord must not think they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, because only Amnon is dead. In fact, Absalom has planned this ever since the day Amnon disgraced his sister Tamar. So now, my lord the king, don't take seriously the report that says all the king's sons are dead. Only Amnon is dead. Meanwhile, Absalom had fled. When the young man who was standing watch looked up, there were many people coming from the road west of him from the side of the mountain. Jonadab said to the king, Look, the king's sons have come. It's exactly like your servant said. Just as he finished speaking, the king's sons entered and wept loudly. Then the king and all his servants also wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, son of Amahud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. After Absalom had fled to Geshur and had been there three years, King David longed to go to Absalom, for David had finished grieving over Amnon's death. Chapter 14 Joab, son of Zeruiah, realized that the king's mind was on Absalom. So Joab sent someone to Tekoa to bring a wise woman from there. He told her, 
Pretend to be in mourning. Dress in mourning clothes. And don't put on any oil. Act like a woman who has been mourning for the dead for a long time. Go to the king and speak these words to him. Then Joab told her exactly what to say. When the woman from Tekoa came to the king, she fell face down to the ground, paid homage, and said, Help me, your majesty. What's the matter? the king asked her. Sadly, I am a widow. My husband died, she said. Your servant had two sons. They were fighting in the field with no one to separate them, and one struck the other and killed him. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant and said, Hand over the one who killed his brother so we may put him to death for the life of the brother he murdered. We will eliminate the heir. They would extinguish my one remaining ember by not preserving my husband's name or posterity on earth. The king told the woman, Go home. I will issue a command on your behalf. Then the woman of Tekoa said to the king, My lord, the king, may any blame be on me and my father's family, and may the king and his throne be innocent. Whoever speaks to you, the king said, bring him to me. He will not trouble you again. She replied, Please, may the king invoke the Lord your God so that the avenger of blood will not increase the loss and they will not eliminate my son. As the Lord lives, he vowed, not a hair of your son will fall to the ground. Then the woman said, Please, may your servant speak a word to my lord the king. Speak, he replied. The woman asked, Why have you devised something similar against the people of God? When the king spoke as he did about this matter, he has pronounced his own guilt. The king has not brought back his own banished one. We will certainly die and be like water poured out on the ground, which can't be recovered. But God would not take away a life. He would devise plans so that the one banished from him does not remain banished. Now, therefore, I've come to present this matter to my lord the king, because the people have made me afraid. Your servant thought, I must speak to the king. Perhaps the king will grant his servant's request. The king will surely listen in order to keep his servant from the grasp of this man who would eliminate both me and my son from God's inheritance. Your servant thought, May the word of my lord the king bring relief, for my lord the king is able to discern the good and the bad like the angel of God. May the lord your God be with you. Then the king answered the woman, I'm going to ask you something. Don't conceal it from me. Let my lord the king speak, the woman replied. The king asked, Did Joab put you up to all this? The woman answered, As you live, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right or left from all my lord the king says. Yes, your servant Joab is the one who gave orders to me. He told your servant exactly what to say. Joab, your servant, has done this to address the issue indirectly. But my Lord has wisdom like the wisdom of the angel of God, knowing everything on earth. Then the king said to Joab, I hereby grant this request. Go, bring back the young man Absalom. Joab fell with his face to the ground in homage and blessed the king. Today, Joab said, your servant knows I have found favor with you, my lord the king, because the king has granted the request of your servant. So Joab got up, went to Geshur, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. However, the king added, he may return to his house, but he may not see my face. So Absalom returned to his house, but he did not see the king. No man in all Israel was as handsome and highly praised as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the top of his head, he did not have a single flaw. When he shaved his head, he shaved it at the end of every year because his hair got so heavy for him that he had to shave it off. He would weigh the hair from his head and it would be five pounds, according to the royal standard. Three sons were born to Absalom and a daughter named Tamar, 
who was a beautiful woman. Absalom resided in Jerusalem two years, but never saw the king. Then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab was unwilling to come to him. So he sent again a second time, but he still would not come. Then Absalom said to his servants, See, Joab has a field right next to mine, and he has barley there. Go and set fire to it. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab came to Absalom's house and demanded, Why did your servants set my field on fire? Look, Absalom explained to Joab, I sent for you and said, Come here, I want to send you to the king to ask, Why have I come back from Geshur? I'd be better off if I were still there. So now, let me see the king. If I am guilty, let him kill me. Joab went to the king and told him. So David summoned Absalom, who came to the king and paid homage with his face to the ground before him. Then the king kissed Absalom. Chapter 15 After this, Absalom got himself a chariot, horses, and fifty men to run before him. He would get up early and stand beside the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone had a grievance to bring before the king for settlement, Absalom called out to him and asked, What city are you from? If he replied, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Absalom said to him, Look, your claims are good and right, but the king does not have anyone to listen to you. He added, If only someone would appoint me judge in the land, then anyone who had a grievance or dispute could come to me and I would make sure he received justice. When a person approached to pay homage to him, Absalom reached out his hand and took hold of him and kissed him. Absalom did this to all the Israelites who came to the king for a settlement. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. When four years had passed, Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron to fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. For your servant made a vow when I lived in Geshur of Aram, saying, If the Lord really brings me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. Go in peace, the king said to him. So he went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent agents throughout the tribes of Israel with this message. When you hear the sound of the ram's horn, you are to say, Absalom has become king in Hebron. Two hundred men from Jerusalem went with Absalom. They had been invited and were going innocently, for they did not know the whole situation. While he was offering the sacrifices, Absalom sent for David's advisor, Ahithophel, the Gilonite, from his city of Gilo. So the conspiracy grew strong, and the people supporting Absalom continued to increase. Then an informer came to David and reported, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. David said to all the servants with him in Jerusalem, Get up, we have to flee, or we will not escape from Absalom. Leave quickly, or he will overtake us quickly, heap disaster on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. The king's servants said to the king, Whatever my lord the king decides, we are your servants. Then the king set out, and his entire household followed him. But he left behind ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out, and all the people followed him. They stopped at the last house while all his servants marched past him. Then all the Carathites, the Pelethites, and the people of Gath, six hundred men who came with him from there, marched past the king. The king said to Ittai of Gath, why are you also going with us? Go back and stay with the new king, since you are both a foreigner and an exile from your homeland. Besides, you only arrived yesterday. Should I make you wander around with us today while I go wherever I can? Go back and take your brothers with you. May the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. But in response, Ittai vowed to the king, As the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, Wherever my lord the king is, whether it means life or death, your servant will be there. March on, David replied to Ittai. 
So Ittai of Gath marched past with all his men and the dependents who were with him. Everyone in the countryside was weeping loudly while all the people were marching out of the city. As the king was crossing the Kidron Valley, all the people were marching past on the road that leads to the wilderness. Zadok was also there, and all the Levites with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set the Ark of God down, and Abiathar offered sacrifices until the people had finished marching past. Then the king instructed Zadok, Return the Ark of God to the city. If I find favor with the Lord, he will bring me back and allow me to see both it and its dwelling place. However, if he should say, I do not delight in you, then here I am. He can do with me whatever pleases him. The king also said to the priest Zadok, Look, return to the city in peace and your two sons with you, your son Ahimeaz and Abiathar's son Jonathan. Remember, I'll wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem and stayed there. David was climbing the slope of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he ascended. His head was covered and he was walking barefoot. All of the people with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they ascended. Then someone reported to David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. Lord, David pleaded, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. When David came to the summit where he used to worship God, Hushai the archite was there to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, If you go away with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and tell Absalom, I will be your servant, your majesty. Previously I was your father's servant, but now I will be your servant. Then you can counteract Ahithophel's counsel for me. Won't the priests, Zadok and Abiathar, be there with you? Report everything you hear from the palace to the priests, Zadok and Abiathar. Take note, their two sons are there with them, Zadok's son, Ahimeaz, and Abiathar's son, Jonathan. Send them to tell me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's personal advisor, entered Jerusalem just as Absalom was entering the city. Chapter 16 When David had gone a little beyond the summit, Ziba, Mephibosheth's servant, was right there to meet him. He had a pair of saddled donkeys loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 bunches of summer fruit, and a clay jar of wine. The king said to Ziba, Why do you have these? Ziba answered, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride. The bread and summer fruit are for the young men to eat, and the wine is for those to drink who become exhausted in the wilderness. Where is your master's grandson? The king asked. Why, he's staying in Jerusalem, Ziba replied to the king, for he said, Today the house of Israel will restore my grandfather's kingdom to me. The king said to Ziba, All that belongs to Mephibosheth is now yours. I bow before you, Ziba said. May I find favor with you, my lord, the king. When King David got to Bahurim, a man belonging to the family of the house of Saul was just coming out. His name was Shimei, son of Gera, and he was yelling curses as he approached. He threw stones at David and at all the royal servants, the people and the warriors on David's right and left. Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of bloodshed, you wicked man. The Lord has paid you back for all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you became king. And the Lord has handed the kingdom over to your son Absalom. Look, you are in trouble because you are a man of bloodshed. Then Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and remove his head. The king replied, Sons of Zeruiah, do we agree on anything? He curses me this way because the Lord told him, Curse David. Therefore, who can say, Why did you do that? 
Then David said to Abishai and all his servants, Look, my own son, my own flesh and blood, intends to take my life. How much more now this Benjaminite? Leave him alone and let him curse me. The Lord has told him to. Perhaps the Lord will see my affliction and restore goodness to me instead of Shimei's curses today. So David and his men proceeded along the road as Shimei was going along the ridge of the hill opposite him. As Shimei went, he cursed David, threw stones at him, and kicked up dust. Finally, the king and all the people with him arrived exhausted, so they rested there. Now Absalom and all the Israelites came to Jerusalem. Ahithophel was also with him. When David's friend Hushai the archite came to Absalom, Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king, long live the king. Is this your loyalty to your friend? Absalom asked Hushai. Why didn't you go with your friend? Not at all, Hushai answered Absalom. I am on the side of the one that the Lord, this people, and all the men of Israel have chosen. I will stay with him. Furthermore, whom will I serve if not his son? As I served in your father's presence, I will also serve in yours. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give me your advice. What should we do? Ahithophel replied to Absalom, Sleep with your father's concubines whom he left to take care of the palace. When all Israel hears that you have become repulsive to your father, everyone with you will be encouraged. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now the advice Ahithophel gave in those days was like someone asking about a word from God. Such was the regard that both David and Absalom had for Ahithophel's advice. Chapter 17 Ahithophel said to Absalom, Let me choose twelve thousand men, and I will set out in pursuit of David tonight. I will attack him while he is weary and discouraged, throw him into a panic, and all the people with him will scatter. I will strike down only the king and bring all the people back to you. When everyone returns except the man you're looking for, all the people will be at peace. This proposal seemed right to Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Then Absalom said, Summon Hushai the archite also. Let's hear what he has to say as well. So Hushai came to Absalom, and Absalom told him, Ahithophel offered this proposal. Should we carry out his proposal? If not, what do you say? Hushai replied to Absalom, The advice Ahithophel has given this time is not good. Hushai continued, You know your father and his men. They are warriors and are desperate like a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Your father is an experienced soldier who won't spend the night with the people. He's probably already hiding in one of the caves or some other place. If some of our troops fall first, someone is sure to hear and say, there's been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. Then, even a brave man with the heart of a lion will lose heart because all Israel knows that your father and the valiant men with him are warriors. Instead, I advise that all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, as numerous as the sand by the sea, be gathered to you, and that you personally go into battle. Then we will attack David wherever we find him, and we will descend on him like dew on the ground. Not even one will be left, neither he nor any of the men with him. If he retreats to some city, all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we will drag its stones into the valley until not even a pebble can be found there. Since the Lord had decreed that Ahithophel's good advice be undermined in order to bring about Absalom's ruin, Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The advice of Hushai the archite is better than Ahithophel's advice. Hushai then told the priests Zadok and Abiathar, This is what Ahithophel advised Absalom and the elders of Israel, and this is what I advised. 
Now send someone quickly and tell David, don't spend the night at the wilderness forward, but be sure to cross over the Jordan, or the king and all the people with him will be devoured. Jonathan and Ahimeaz were staying at Enrogel, where a servant girl would come and pass along information to them. They, in turn, would go and inform King David because they dared not be seen entering the city. However, a young man did see them and informed Absalom. So the two left quickly and came to the house of a man in Bahurim. He had a well in his courtyard, and they climbed down into it. Then the wife took the cover, placed it over the mouth of the well, and scattered grain on it so nobody would know anything. Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house and asked, Where are Ahimeaz and Jonathan? They passed by toward the water, the woman replied to them. The men searched but did not find them, so they returned to Jerusalem. After they had gone, Ahimeaz and Jonathan climbed out of the well and went and informed King David. They told him, Get up and immediately ford the river, for Ahithophel has given this advice against you. So David and all the people with him got up and crossed the Jordan. By daybreak there was no one who had not crossed the Jordan. When Ahithophel realized that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He set his house in order and hanged himself. So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. David had arrived at Mahanaim by the time Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Now Absalom had appointed Amasa over the army in Joab's place. Amasa was the son of a man named Ithra, the Israelite. Ithra had married Abigail, daughter of Nahash. Abigail was a sister to Zeruiah, Joab's mother, and Israel and Absalom camped in the land of Gilead. When David came to Mahanaim, Shobai, son of Nahash from Reba of the Ammonites, Maker, son of Amiel from Lodibar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite from Rogalim, brought beds, basins, and pottery items. They also brought wheat, barley, flour, roasted grain, beans, lentils, honey curds, sheep, goats, and cheese from the herd for David and for the people with him to eat. They had reasoned, the people must be hungry, exhausted, and thirsty in the wilderness. Chapter 18 David reviewed his troops and appointed commanders of thousands and of hundreds over them. He then sent out the troops, a third under Joab, a third under Joab's brother Abishai, son of Zeruiah, and a third under Itai of Gath. The king said to the troops, I must also march out with you. You must not go, the people pleaded. If we have to flee, they will not pay attention to us. Even if half of us die, they will not pay any attention to us because you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore, it is better if you support us from the city. I will do whatever you think is best, the king replied to them. So he stood beside the city gate while all the troops marched out by hundreds and thousands. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Itai, treat the young man Absalom gently for my sake. All the people heard the king's orders to all the commanders about Absalom. Then David's forces marched into the field to engage Israel in battle, which took place in the forest of Ephraim. Israel's army was defeated by David's soldiers, and the slaughter there was vast that day, 20,000 dead. The battle spread over the entire area, and that day the forest claimed more people than the sword. Absalom was riding on his mule when he happened to meet David's soldiers. When the mule went under the tangled branches of a large oak tree, Absalom's head was caught fast in the tree. The mule under him kept going, so he was suspended in midair. One of the men saw him and informed Joab. He said, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. You just saw him? Joab exclaimed. Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? I would have given you ten silver pieces and a belt. The man replied to Joab, Even if I had the weight of a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For we heard the king command you, Abishai and Itai, protect the young man Absalom for me. 
If I had jeopardized my own life, and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have abandoned me. Joab said, I'm not going to waste time with you. He then took three spears in his hand and thrust them into Absalom's chest. While Absalom was still alive in the oak tree, ten young men who were Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Joab blew the ram's horn, and the troops broke off their pursuit of Israel because Joab restrained them. They took Absalom, threw him into a large pit in the forest, and raised up a huge mound of stones over him, and all Israel fled, each to his tent. When he was alive, Absalom had taken a pillar and raised it up for himself in the king's valley, since he thought, I have no son to preserve the memory of my name. So he named the pillar after himself. It is still called Absalom's Monument today. Ahimeaz, son of Zadok, said, Please let me run and tell the king the good news that the Lord has vindicated him by freeing him from his enemies. Joab replied to him, You are not the man to take good news today. You may do it another day, but today you aren't taking good news because the king's son is dead. Joab then said to a Cushite, Go tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed to Joab and took off running. However, Ahimeaz, son of Zadok, persisted and said to Joab, No matter what, please let me also run behind the Cushite. Joab replied, My son, why do you want to run since you won't get a reward? No matter what, I want to run. Then run, Joab said to him. So Ahimeaz ran by way of the plain and outran the Cushite. David was sitting between the city gates when the watchman went up to the roof of the city gate and over to the wall. The watchman looked out and saw a man running alone. He called out and told the king. The king said, If he's alone, he bears good news. As the first runner came closer, the watchman saw another man running. He called out to the gatekeeper, Look, another man is running alone. This one is also bringing good news, said the king. The watchman said, The way the first man runs looks to me like the way Ahimeaz, son of Zadok, runs. This is a good man. He comes with good news, the king commented. Ahimeaz called out to the king, All is well, and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. He continued, Blessed be the Lord your God. He delivered up the men who rebelled against my lord the king. The king asked, Is the young man Absalom all right? Ahimeaz replied, When Joab sent the king's servant and your servant, I saw a big disturbance, but I don't know what it was. The king said, Move aside and stand here. So he stood to one side. Just then the Cushite came and said, May my lord the king hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by freeing you from all who rise against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom all right? The Cushite replied, I wish that the enemies of my lord the king, along with all who rise up against you with evil intent, would become like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber above the city gate and wept. As he walked, he cried, My son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Absalom, my son, my son. Chapter 19. It was reported to Joab, the king is weeping, he's mourning over Absalom. That day's victory was turned into mourning for all the troops because on that day the troops heard, the king is grieving over his son. So they returned to the city quietly that day like troops come in when they are humiliated after fleeing in battle. But the king covered his face and cried loudly, My son, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab went into the house to the king and said, Today you have shamed all your soldiers, those who saved your life as well as your sons, your wives, and your concubines, by loving your enemies and hating those who hate you. Today you have made it clear that the commanders and soldiers mean nothing to you, 
In fact, today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead, it would be fine with you. Now get up, go out and encourage your soldiers, for I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will remain with you tonight. This will be worse for you than all the trouble that has come to you from your youth until now. So the king got up and sat in the city gate, and all the people were told, Look, the king is sitting in the city gate. Then they all came into the king's presence. Meanwhile, each Israelite had fled to his tent. People throughout all the tribes of Israel were arguing among themselves, saying, The king rescued us from the grasp of our enemies, and he saved us from the grasp of the Philistines. But now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. But Absalom, the man we anointed over us, has died in battle. So why do you say nothing about restoring the king? King David sent word to the priests, Zadok and Abiathar, Say to the elders of Judah, Why should you be the last to restore the king to his palace? The talk of all Israel has reached the king at his house. You are my brothers, my flesh and blood. So why should you be the last to restore the king? And tell Amasa, aren't you my flesh and blood? May God punish me and do so severely if you don't become commander of my army from now on instead of Joab. So he won over all the men of Judah and they unanimously sent word to the king, come back you and all your servants. Then the king returned. When he arrived at the Jordan, Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and escort him across the Jordan. Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjaminite from Bahurim, hurried down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men from Benjamin with him. Ziba, an attendant from the house of Saul, with his fifteen sons and twenty servants, also rushed down to the Jordan ahead of the king. They forded the Jordan to bring the king's household across and do whatever the king desired. When Shimei, son of Gera, crossed the Jordan, he fell face down before the king and said to him, My lord, don't hold me guilty and don't remember your servant's wrongdoing on the day my lord the king left Jerusalem. May the king not take it to heart, for your servant knows that I have sinned. But look, today I am the first one of the entire house of Joseph to come down to meet my lord the king. Abishai, son of Zeruiah, asked, Shouldn't Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the lord's anointed? David answered, Sons of Zeruiah, Do we agree on anything? Have you become my adversary today? Should any man be killed in Israel today? Am I not aware that today I'm king over Israel? So the king said to Shimei, You will not die. Then the king gave him his oath. Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, also went down to meet the king. He had not taken care of his feet, trimmed his mustache, or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day he returned safely. When he came from Jerusalem to meet the king, the king asked him, Mephibosheth, why didn't you come with me? My lord, the king, he replied, my servant Ziba betrayed me. Actually, your servant said, I'll saddle the donkey for myself so that I may ride it and go with the king, for your servant is lame. Ziba slandered your servant to my lord, the king, But my lord the king is like the angel of God, so do whatever you think best. For my grandfather's entire family deserves death from my lord the king, but you set your servant among those who eat at your table. So what further right do I have to keep on making appeals to the king? The king said to him, Why keep on speaking about these matters of yours? I hereby declare you and Ziba are to divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Instead, since my lord the king has come to his palace safely, let Ziba take it all. Barzillai the Gileadite had come down from Rogalim and accompanied the king to the Jordan River to see him off at the Jordan. Barzillai was a very old man, 80 years old, and since he was a very wealthy man, he had provided for the needs of the king while he stayed in Mahanaim. The king said to Barzillai, Cross over with me and I'll provide for you at my side in Jerusalem. Barzillai replied to the king, How many years of my life are left that I should go up to Jerusalem with the king? I'm now eighty years old. 
Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or drinks? Can I still hear the voice of male and female singers? Why should your servant be an added burden to my Lord the King? Since your servant is only going with the king a little way across the Jordan, why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant return so that I may die in my own city near the tomb of my father and mother. But here is your servant, Kimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king. Do for him what seems good to you. The king replied, Kimham will cross over with me and I will do for him what seems good to you, and whatever you desire from me, I will do for you. So all the people crossed the Jordan, and then the king crossed. The king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and Barzillai returned to his home. The king went on to Gilgal, and Kimham went with him. All the troops of Judah and half of Israel escorted the king. Suddenly, all the men of Israel came to the king. They asked him, why did our brothers, the men of Judah, take you away secretly and transport the king and his household across the Jordan along with all of David's men? All the men of Judah responded to the men of Israel, because the king is our relative. Why does this make you angry? Have we ever eaten anything of the kings or been honored at all? The men of Israel answered the men of Judah, we have ten shares in the king, so we have a greater claim to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Weren't we the first to speak of restoring our king? But the words of the men of Judah were harsher than those of the men of Israel. Chapter 20 Now a wicked man, a Benjaminite named Sheba, son of Bichri, happened to be there. He blew the ram's horn and shouted, We have no portion in David, no inheritance in Jesse's son. Each man to his tent, Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, son of Bichri. But the men of Judah from the Jordan all the way to Jerusalem remained loyal to their king. When David came to his palace in Jerusalem, he took the ten concubines he had left to take care of the palace and placed them under guard. He provided for them, but he was not intimate with them. They were confined until the day of their death, living as widows. The king said to Amasa, Summon the men of Judah to me within three days, and be here yourself. Amasa went to summon Judah, but he took longer than the time allotted him. So David said to Abishai, Sheba, son of Bichri, will do more harm to us than Absalom. Take your Lord's soldiers and pursue him, or he will find fortified cities and elude us. So Joab's men, the Carathites, the Pelathites, and all the warriors marched out under Abishai's command. But they left Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. They were at the great stone in Gibeon when Amasa joined them. Joab was wearing his uniform, and over it was a belt around his waist with a sword in its sheath. As he approached, the sword fell out. Joab asked Amasa, Are you well, my brother? Then with his right hand, Joab grabbed Amasa by the beard to kiss him. Amasa was not on guard against the sword in Joab's hand, and Joab stabbed him in the stomach with it and spilled his intestines out on the ground. Joab did not stab him again, and Amasa died. Joab and his brother Abishai pursued Sheba, son of Bichri, one of Joab's young men had stood over Amasa, saying, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. Now Amasa had been writhing in his blood in the middle of the highway, and the man had seen that all the troops stopped. So he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him because he realized that all those who encountered Amasa were stopping. When he was removed from the highway, all the men passed by and followed Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel of Beth Maaca. All the Beerites came together and followed him. Joab's troops came and besieged Sheba and Abel of Beth Maaca. They built a siege ramp against the outer wall of the city. While all the troops with Joab were battering the wall to make it collapse, a wise woman called out from the city, Listen, listen, 
Please tell Joab to come here and let me speak with him. When he had come near her, the woman asked, Are you Joab? I am, he replied. Listen to the words of your servant, she said to him. He answered, I'm listening. She said, In the past, they used to say, Seek counsel in Abel. And that's how they settled disputes. I am one of the peaceful and faithful in Israel, but you're trying to destroy a city that is like a mother in Israel. Why would you devour the Lord's inheritance? Joab protested, Never. I would never devour or demolish. That is not the case. There is a man named Sheba, son of Bichri, from the hill country of Ephraim, who has rebelled against King David. Deliver this one man, and I will withdraw from the city. The woman replied to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown over the wall to you. The woman went to all the people with her wise counsel, and they cut off the head of Sheba, son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. So he blew the ram's horn, and they dispersed from the city, each to his own tent. Joab returned to the king in Jerusalem. Joab commanded the whole army of Israel. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and Pelathites. Adoram was over forced labor. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was court historian. Sheba was court secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And in addition, Ira, the Jairite, was David's priest. Chapter 21. During David's reign, there was a famine for three successive years, so David inquired of the Lord. The Lord answered, It is due to Saul and to his bloody family because he killed the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites were not Israelites, but rather a remnant of the Amorites. The Israelites had taken an oath concerning them, but Saul had tried to kill them in his zeal for the Israelites and Judah. So David summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. He asked the Gibeonites, What should I do for you? How can I make atonement so that you will bring a blessing on the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites said to him, We are not asking for silver and gold from Saul or his family, and we cannot put anyone to death in Israel. Whatever you say, I will do for you, he said. They replied to the king, as for the man who annihilated us and plotted to destroy us so we would not exist within the whole territory of Israel, let seven of his male descendants be handed over to us so we may hang them in the presence of the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen. The king answered, I will hand them over. David spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between David and Jonathan, Saul's son. But the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, who were the two sons whom Rizpah, daughter of Aiah, had borne to Saul, and the five sons whom Merab, daughter of Saul, had borne to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Meholathite, and handed them over to the Gibeonites. They hanged them on the hill in the presence of the Lord. The seven of them died together. They were executed in the first days of the harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. Rizpah, Aiah's daughter, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on the rock from the beginning of the harvest until the rain poured down from heaven on the bodies. She kept the birds of the sky from them by day and the wild animals by night. When it was reported to David what Saul's concubine, Rizpah, daughter of Aiah, had done, he went out and got the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from the citizens of Jabesh-Gilead. They had stolen them from the public square of beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung the bodies the day the Philistines killed Saul at Gilboa. David had the bones brought from there. They gathered up the bones of Saul's family who had been hanged and buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan at Zelah in the land of Benjamin in the tomb of Saul's father Kish. They did everything the king commanded. After this, God was receptive to prayer for the land. The Philistines again waged war against Israel. David went down with his soldiers and they fought the Philistines, but David became exhausted. Then Ishbi Benob, one of the descendants of the giant whose bronze spear weighed about eight pounds and who wore new armor, intended to kill David. 
But Abishai, son of Zeruiah, came to his aid, struck the Philistine, and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, You must never again go out with us to battle. You must not extinguish the lamp of Israel. After this, there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob. At that time, Sibachai the Hushathite killed Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giant. Once again, there was a battle with the Philistines at Gob, and Elhanan, son of Jaara Oregim the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath of Gath. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. At Gath, there was still another battle. A huge man was there with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in all. He, too, was descended from the giant. When he taught at Israel, Jonathan, son of David's brother Shimei, killed him. These four were descended from the giant in Gath and were killed by David and his soldiers. Chapter 22 David spoke the words of this song to the Lord on the day the Lord rescued him from the grasp of all his enemies and from the grasp of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, and my Savior. You save me from violence. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. For the waves of death engulfed me, the torrents of destruction terrified me, the ropes of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. I called to the Lord in my distress, I called to my God. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry for help reached his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked, the foundations of the heavens trembled. They shook because he burned with anger. Smoke rose from his nostrils, and consuming fire came from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by it. He bent the heavens and came down, total darkness beneath his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew, soaring on the wings of the wind. He made darkness a canopy around him, a gathering of water and thick clouds. From the radiance of his presence, blazing coals were ignited. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High made his voice heard. He shot arrows and scattered them. He hurled lightning bolts and routed them. The depths of the sea became visible. The foundations of the world were exposed at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He pulled me out of deep water. He rescued me from my powerful enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out to a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. He repaid me according to the cleanness of my hands. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not turned from my God to wickedness. Indeed, I let all his ordinances guide me, and I have not disregarded his statutes. I was blameless before him and kept myself from my iniquity. So the Lord repaid me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. With the faithful you prove yourself faithful. With the blameless you prove yourself blameless. With the pure, you prove yourself pure, but with the crooked, you prove yourself shrewd. You rescue an oppressed people, but your eyes are set against the proud. You humble them. Lord, you are my lamp. The Lord illuminates my darkness. With you, I can attack a barricade, and with my God, I can leap over a wall. God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is a rock? Only our God. God is my strong refuge. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me securely on the heights. He trains my hands for war. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. 
You have given me the shield of your salvation. Your help exalts me. You make a spacious place beneath me for my steps, and my ankles do not give way. I pursue my enemies and destroy them. I do not turn back until they are wiped out. I wipe them out and crush them, and they do not rise. They fall beneath my feet. You have clothed me with strength for battle. You subdue my adversaries beneath me. You have made my enemies retreat before me. I annihilate those who hate me. They look, but there is no one to save them. They look to the Lord, but he does not answer them. I pulverize them like dust of the earth. I crush them and trample them like mud in the streets. You have freed me from the feuds among my people. You have preserved me as head of nations. A people I had not known serve me. Foreigners submit to me cringing. As soon as they hear, they obey me. Foreigners lose heart and come trembling from their fortifications. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. God, the rock of my salvation, is exalted. God, he grants me vengeance and casts down peoples under me. He frees me from my enemies. You exalt me above my adversaries. You rescue me from violent men. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, Lord. I will sing praises about your name. He is a tower of salvation for his king. He shows loyalty to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Chapter 23 These are the last words of David. The declaration of David, son of Jesse, the declaration of the man raised on high, the one anointed by the God of Jacob. This is the most delightful of Israel's songs. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, The one who rules the people with justice, who rules in the fear of God, is like the morning light when the sun rises on a cloudless morning, the glistening of rain on sprouting grass. Is it not true my house is with God? For he has established a permanent covenant with me, ordered and secured in every detail. Will he not bring about my whole salvation and my every desire? But all the wicked are like thorns raked aside. They can never be picked up by hand. The man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear. They will be completely burned up on the spot. These are the names of David's warriors. Josheb Bathshebeth, the Tachamanite, was chief of the officers. He wielded his spear against 800 men that he killed at one time. After him, Eleazar, son of Dodo, son of an Ahohite, was among the three warriors with David when they defied the Philistines. The men of Israel retreated in the place they had gathered for battle, but Eleazar stood his ground and attacked the Philistines until his hand was tired and stuck to his sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Then the troops came back to him, but only to plunder the dead. After him was Shammah, son of Agi, the Hararite, the Philistines had assembled in formation where there was a field full of lentils. The troops fled from the Philistines, but Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field, defended it, and struck down the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Three of the thirty leading warriors went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam, while a company of Philistines was camping at Rephaim Valley. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and a Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David was extremely thirsty and said, If only someone would bring me water to drink from the well at the city gate of Bethlehem. So three of the warriors broke through the Philistine camp and drew water from the well at the gate of Bethlehem. They brought it back to David, but he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out to the Lord. David said, Lord, I would never do such a thing. Is this not the blood of men who risk their lives? 
so he refused to drink it. Such were the exploits of the three warriors. Abishai, Joab's brother and son of Zeruiah, was leader of the three. He wielded his spear against 300 men and killed them, gaining a reputation among the three. Was he not more honored than the three? He became their commander, even though he did not become one of the three. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was the son of a brave man from Kabziel, a man of many exploits. Benaiah killed two sons of Ariel of Moab, and he went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. He also killed an Egyptian, an impressive man. Even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaiah went down to him with a staff, snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and then killed him with his own spear. These were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, who had a reputation among the three warriors. He was the most honored of the thirty, but he did not become one of the three. David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Among the thirty were Joab's brother Asahel, Elhanan, son of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shammah the Herodite, Elika the Herodite, Helez the Paltite, Ira, son of Ikesh the Tikoite, Abiezer the Anathothite, Mabunei the Hushathite, Zalman the Ahohite, Maharei the Netophathite, Heleb, son of Bana, the Netophathite, Itai, son of Ribai, from Gibeah of the Benjaminites, Beniah, the Pirathonite, Hidei, from the Wadais of Gaash, Abai Alban, the Arbathite, Asmaveth, the Barhamite, Eliaba, the Shealbanite, the sons of Jashan, Jonathan, son of Shammah, the Hararite, Ahiram, son of Sherar, the Hararite, Eliphalet, son of Abishai, son of the Meachathite, Eliam, son of Ahithophel, the Galenite, Hezro, the Carmelite, Paariah, the Arbite, Igal, son of Nathan from Zobah, Bani, the Gadite, Zelek the Ammonite, Naharai the Beerothite, the armor-bearer for Joab, son of Zeruiah, Ira the Ithrite, Garab the Ithrite, and Uriah the Hethite. There were thirty-seven in all. Chapter 24 the Lord's anger burned against Israel again, and he stirred up David against them to say, Go, count the people of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of his army, Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, and register the troops so I can know their number. Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times more than they are, while my lord the king looks on. But why does my lord the king want to do this? Yet the king's order prevailed over Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army left the king's presence to register the troops of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and camped in Aurora, south of the town in the middle of the valley, and then proceeded toward Gad and Jazer. They went to Gilead and to the land of the Hittites and continued on to Dan Jaan, around to Sidon, they went to the fortress of Tyre and all the cities of the Hivites and Canaanites. Afterward, they went to the Negev of Judah at Beersheba. When they had gone through the whole land, they returned to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. Joab gave the king the total of the registration of the troops. There were 800,000 valiant armed men from Israel and 500,000 men from Judah. David's conscience troubled him after he had taken a census of the troops. He said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, because I have been very foolish, please take away your servant's guilt. When David got up in the morning, the word of the Lord had come to the prophet Gad, David's seer. Go and say to David, This is what the Lord says. I am offering you three choices. Choose one of them, and I will do it to you. So Gad went to David, told him the choices, and asked him, 
Do you want three years of famine to come on your land, to flee from your foes three months while they pursue you, or to have a plague in your land three days? Now consider carefully what answer I should take back to the one who sent me. David answered Gad, I have great anxiety. Please let us fall into the Lord's hands because his mercies are great, but don't let me fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the appointed time, and from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men died. Then the angel extended his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, but the Lord relented concerning the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand now. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. When David saw the angel striking the people, he said to the Lord, Look, I am the one who has sinned. I am the one who has done wrong. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and my father's family. Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go up and set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. David went up in obedience to Gad's command, just as the Lord had commanded. Arona looked down and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So he went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. Arona said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David replied, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord so the plague on the people may be halted. Arona said to David, My lord, the king, may take whatever he wants and offer it. Here are the oxen for a burnt offering and the threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Arona gives everything here to the king. Then he said to the king, May the lord your God accept you. The king answered Arona, No, I insist on buying it from you for a price. For I will not offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for twenty ounces of silver. He built an altar to the Lord there and offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord was receptive to prayer for the land and the plague on Israel ended. We'd like to thank you for joining the FP Network today, where we are loving God, loving people, and treasuring Jesus together.